Welcome to the Solution Nation podcast. My name is Sean Snowday, and I'm the president of Solution Nation. Solution Nation is dedicated to providing a platform for investors to learn about Israel's most dynamic public and private companies. We interview lead venture capitalists, Wall Street analysts, investment bankers, and managers of incubators and accelerators. Today's guest is Degany Verid, and the topic is investing in Israeli ag tech. There is a ton of agricultural innovation in Israel, whether it is precise genetics, targeted pesticides, indoor farming, robotics, precision irrigation, data management, or supply chain management, Israeli companies are working hard to relieve the world of its current food insecurity. Please remember that all content provided on the Solution Nation podcast and website is for educational purposes only. Nothing shall be construed as investment advice. Investment decisions shall not be made based on information, written, verbal, or otherwise, posted or spoken on Solution Nation. Conduct your own research or consult with your own investment advisors before making investment decisions. So here's my good friend, the host of the show, and the CEO of Solution Nation, David Wanatik. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Solution Nation. I'm David Wanatik. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's session is going to focus on investing in Israeli ag agricultural technology. Ag tech. Uh, speaking on this subject today, I'm very pleased to introduce Deganit Verid. Uh, Deganit Verid is the Chief Executive Officer of Smart Agro Fund. Deganit was a venture partner at Entree Capital, managing the agri-tech and food tech investments. Um, she, uh, pr prior to that, she has experience uh, as a Vice President of Research and Development and CEO roles in numerous companies such as Perigo, Hazara, and N Nobactra. She started her journey in the semiconductor industry with Intel, and in her last position at Intel, she was Israel's Fab CS Site Manager. Uh, Deganate holds a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering from the Technion. So um, before I welcome Deganate, I just want to point out her name. For those that uh, don't know Hebrew, it has a very uh, appropriate name. Deganate is a uh, flower that's found in grain, and uh, Verid is, is rose, so it's a very, very nice name. So uh, Deganate, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Pleased to meet so, you. Tell us a little bit about this Smart Agro Fund, what you focus, what stage of uh, entry you go into different uh, early stage companies. Uh, Smart Agro is a fund out of the Israeli Stock Exchange. We are raising money from the Israeli public. The idea was to make uh, the investments in uh, high tech in Israel available for the general public so they can also enjoy uh, the startup nation uh, fruits. Uh, the the thinking process is to keep it uh, evergreen and to build a portfolio that will bring value to our uh, investors. So when we look at that, we looked at the agri, agri tech arena and we realized that there are big problems in this uh, area worldwide. Everyone feels the climate change, drought issues, uh, water sanctuaries and the ability to maintain uh, uh, feeding the world. And uh, we believe that when we solve big problems, there is also an opportunity to make a lot of money. So we were, were actually doing good and making money at the same time. So we believe that by investing in companies, uh, at uh, usually we invest in the growth stage, meaning there is some market traction. Uh, the company just started sales. So this is where and the experience, uh, for example, that I have, you know, operations, R&D, transfer of technology, ability to scale factories and so on, comes uh, to play, as well as uh, validating the product market fit. Great. So typically, what size um, investments do you make? What's the average check size? Uh, which rounds do you participate in? And what's the size of your uh, assets under management? So uh, we currently uh, invest between half a million to $2 million in a round. We are usually followers. We were leaders in one round, but usually we're followers. We have six portfolio companies and it varies from seed round to C round because I'm less uh, um, uh, sensitive to the stage. Uh, I'm more sensitive to uh, the ability of the company to uh, become a $1 million, $1 billion company. 
that is kind of the vision we're aligning to. We're looking for big check exits and high multipliers. And this can happen both in early stage companies that you see the potential very early already have a validation of the market or later stage that you say, okay, maybe the valuation is higher, but I know I will be able to get the multipliers right. Okay. And how big is the fund in terms of assets under management? So we raised so far, so far 50 million shekels, which is about uh, $15 million, a bit more than that, maybe. Uh, and uh, because we're evergreen, this is not like our final number. Uh, we, if we have uh, good opportunities, we still have, for example, space right now for additional investment to make. So it's it's not like uh, we're uh, in pressure of making uh, investments or uh, we're saying, okay, we're almost out of money because uh, public is looking for us to increase our portfolio and always find good opportunities. And that's what we're doing. So the fact that uh, Smart Agro Fund is publicly traded, it's evergreen, uh, cash continues to flow through it. So does that mean it's um, more probable that a portfolio company would be able to receive follow-on investing through your fund versus a, a privately held VC? Not necessarily because privately held VCs usually keep money for follow-up investments. Uh, for us, it really depends on the on the company. And if uh, we want to be diluted or want to continue and hold our shares. Okay, we, we are in a stage where we want to help our company succeed. So uh, for us being diluted to relatively low percentage is not an issue as long as we will get our multipliers. Uh, we're not looking to have big holds uh, of the companies. We're fine with small holds. Uh, the idea is that because of the background, and we work with all the companies very closely, whether we are on the board or not. We are very involved uh, uh, investor, connecting to customers, connecting to, to corporates, connecting to the industry, or even sitting with the CEO and talking about how do we start the customer success operations for the company and how do you maintain your, uh, you know, your customer su support for one company and the other companies working with the VP R&D on how to build the product. Would you say it might is, be, uh, yeah. would, ahead, would, you, would, would you say it might be an advantage for a company to receive funding through, through a smart agro fund because it's more democratic in terms of um, more shareholders? Uh, so more people may have a vested interest in buying product from one of your portfolio companies because they're more likely to own shares through your fund versus a VC that has a limited number of investors in it? Um, I I can't tell you that I see that uh, my uh, LPs and the public is uh, necessarily uh, a, a shareholder that has interest in the companies. Most of the people that go into this uh, investment are looking for access to startups with, with high probability. They believe that my ability to invest directly in companies is better than their ability to invest directly because of the professional background, because of my experience. So I think that they see Smart Agro as a mean, very professional mean to invest and to grow the company we invest in, less on the collaboration, looking forward for uh, the ability to uh, get access to the technology. Okay, so now we can talk about uh, ag tech in the realm of uh, the, the solution nation. Um, maybe we can start by talking about precise genetics. What does that mean? And um, please explain that. And if there's any companies that uh, you want to mention that play in this area, feel free to do that. Okay, so precise genetics and biotech are uh, kind of hold, held together. When we look at the problems of the world, uh, there are seed companies that are working to solve those problems through uh, traditional breeding. That means a crossing, a selection, a process, and so on. A breeding is a very long process because you need to build generations of the plants and so on. So uh, if you want to get a steady uh, trait, like drought resistance, for example, or a certain disease resistance on a plant, and you are uh, able to find the gene, through gene editing, you are able to gain that trait very fast and stabilize it in the plant. 
the process of breathing is much, much shorter. Now, there is a lot of resistance around GMO. Today, there is less resistance around CRISPR-Cas solutions. Uh, we invested in Better Seeds. It's one of our portfolio companies, our first investment. And uh, they do CRISPR-Cas editing uh, for plants. And they were recognized as one of the leading uh, companies worldwide in doing uh, CRISPR-Cas gene editing and, and mastering this technology. Uh, they already started uh, doing that for, uh, for example, for automatic harvesting of uh, cocoa and coffee. And they are working on cowpeas because they believe that when you look at soybeans, they are very intensive in water uh, uh, requirements and they are very uh, drought, uh, low drought and heat resistance. So soya that feeds a lot of our products today worldwide is going to have significant difficulties being grown in various areas in the world. So, for example, going to cowpeas and finding a solution how to for it to replace soybeans is one of their solutions. Another thing that uh, we see under this is the alternative protein uh, uh, part. And uh, we invested in Plantish. Plantish is taking plant-based uh, protein and turns it into filet of, um, of salmon, like a big problem and difficult problem to solve. Today, aquaculture and uh, overfishery is depleting the seas. Uh, growing salmon in uh, Norway fjords is becoming very, very difficult. There are diseases that attack and uh, pests that attack the salmon. And there is some constraint in the ability to grow salmon uh, in capture uh, from space and the combination of uh, space and pests. And we believe that through plant-based, we can still feed the world with nutri nutrient uh, uh, fish without having the fish. What, what are some of the downsides or risks of precise gen genetics? Um, I think that sometimes when input companies combine their genetically modified uh, uh, with the input that uh, ties the farmer to their own product and you have to buy the seeds with uh, pesticides and uh, things like that, I think that that brings a risk in. For example, you, you saw that the problem of round, Roundup, it caused damage. They had to use it because the seeds were resistant to this herbicide. That was a trait that they went for. And uh, they actually, I, I'm not sure that, I think it's still in court. It, it caused some health problems to the farmers. And uh, today you, you can see that uh, some of the plants developed uh, resistance to these pests. So you have super weed attacking a lot of areas in uh, um, in North America. So things like that uh, are, are causing uh, significant problems. And there are companies working to solve that through other means. There is a company in Israel called the WIDA that is building a methodology that you can uh, turn the super weed into uh, by using uh, pollens that are not fertile and uh, practically preventing the next generation from growing. So there are other types of solutions you can bring uh, into the, into the agri-tech that is not necessarily hardcore chemicals that kill everything that is around there. And how do the costs of pre precise genetics compare to, to regular seeds and so forth, uh, both, you know, purchasing the, the, the seeds and then the total cost of developing the crop? I think that the total cost of developing the crop is similar because you will need, I, I was a VP R&D in a seed company, so I know the cost of, uh, of uh, traditional breeding. Uh, I think it's similar. You need uh, PCRs for your tests and you need a lot of uh, screening abilities, uh, but uh, you, you have a shorter time uh, regarding building the generations and stabilizing the seeds and running uh, very vast screenings. So I would say it's relatively similar because your ability to reach the stable seeds in uh, genetically modified is much faster. Okay, great. So we can move on to another topic now. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about targeted pesticides and biological pest control. Uh, yes, there are definitely uh, solutions there. We are still looking for investment, by the way, uh, in this area. 
And the reason we put it as a target is really because we believe that uh, soil restoration, for example, is something that is needed. Uh, you want to be very specific in how you attack diseases. Some of the uh, solutions out there are very broad uh, treatment of uh, problems. And if you come and become very precise, either in the way you spray, for example, there is a green eye today that is doing precision spraying on uh, and able to see a very early detection of uh, green over green uh, in uh, spraying. It saves a lot of inputs and it's uh, the amount of, uh, you know, uh, pesticides you need to apply is becoming very, very low. Uh, beyond that, I think that there is a lot of companies that are working for, for example, in, with pheromones in order to move the pests away from the, from the plants. There are companies that are working with specific biology uh, solution, uh, like uh, uh, pests that attack pests, beneficial pests is something that is growing very, very nicely. And uh, there are companies, for example, that are doing pest control with RF energy. Uh, they are able to attack very, very small uh, insects at their very early stage, and that way they prevent it from developing into a big problem in the greenhouse. So the variety of solutions that are being generated today is, is pretty used. Uh, so beyond that, we're looking for biological solutions. There are our, uh, solutions out there already, the rise in the, in the pricing of pesticides and the fertilizers, bringing the biology to a similar cost uh, uh, structure. And I believe the, the adoption of those solutions is going to go up with time. Okay. And um, what, what are your thoughts on organic pesticides? Uh, are those uh, uh, attractive to you or not so much? It depends because, you know, sometimes people tell me, well, it's a natural uh, material, so it's okay to use an organic. And I'm saying, uh, you know, also cyanide is natural and it kills people. So uh, the whole idea of having organic pesticides is that their, their source is natural. They're usually very, very active and very aggressive, but very short term. So the leftovers of the chemicals, it is chemicals, but nature uh, naturally appearing in uh, in the nature um, i think it's it's a it's a nice uh, solution personally i can tell you i don't buy organic because i don't see the benefit of organic uh, food but i might be wrong uh, you know they they are using different material materials to treat the plants so uh, i believe maybe there is less impact on the environment which is excellent but at the end of the day, from health of the people that eat it, I think that with the health uh, regulation, you have to wait X amount of time after you spray and so on. It's the, the end result on your table is similar. If you look at a more developing country like India, they may, they may not have all the regulations in place to make sure the chemicals are at least relatively uh, harmless um, and don't have regulations to protect people from eating bad food. Uh, would you say that organic may be more important in those types of countries? Uh, probably yes, but I don't see the guy that sells uh, free tomatoes on the side of the road uh, even aware that organics ex ex exists. So if you're looking at the masses of the population that is not uh, doesn't have the means to buy organic, they will not be able to even think about organic as an option. So definitely for the middle class and above in, in, uh, in uh, countries like India, organic is definitely the better uh, choice. Okay, let's uh, shift gears and talk about advanced growing systems. Uh, what's an example of an advanced growing system? Uh, today, the, the advanced growing systems that you will see is uh, for leafy greens, indoor farming, uh, looking at uh, the Dutch uh, greenhouses that are glass houses that you grow in uh, in, in areas that uh, doesn't have enough sun or is too cold to grow uh, tomatoes and cucumbers or whatever. And this is something that is going to be pushed uh, very fast forward. Now, we had a conversation yesterday with a grower in the U.S. that says that 
for example, all the uh, soft uh, fruits like tomatoes, uh, cucumbers, eggplants, and so on, in the U.S. is moving indoors. It's not moving to high-tech greenhouses, but it's definitely moving into greenhouses. So people understand that keeping growing uh, fruits inside uh, is, is going to be the best solution to get good yields. And if you continue to grow outside, you're probably going to get lower yields. Look at the tomato, the ketchup uh, crisis this year. Uh, not enough uh, tomatoes that are grown for ketchup because this is all uh, outdoor growth, uh, impact of yields because of drought, impact of yields because of uh, severe heat. Uh, when you move into protected the environment, you're able to secure your yields a bit better. Now, when we look at more advanced, we're talking of indoor, fully indoor growth of tomatoes, cucumbers, all the, uh, the vegetables that we usually find. And the reason for moving uh, to these areas is really food security. Uh, you see that uh, up until today, the ability to justify the cost was very difficult, but technology is catching up and you can, you can find companies that are very quickly developing solutions for growing these kind of crops uh, in a confined uh, environment. Meaning you will be able to grow uh, year round tomatoes and cucumbers and uh, eggplants in uh, the Sahara, if you have energy source or in the Emirates. Uh, so so the, in the Arab countries, which are extremely hot or desert like, and, um, I believe that this will penetrate to Europe and uh, and uh, North uh, America relatively fast in the next few years because of the climate change. You have to secure the people food, otherwise you're going to be in a very unstable political situations. So in terms of indoor farming, how electricity intensive is that? Um, you have to heat, you know, control the heat and air conditioning and lighting. Um, are they using solar to, to help with the electricity production? And then secondly, with the indoor farming, how scalable is that? You know, can you have indoors for acres and acres uh, or is it relatively not scalable? So, for example, I had a conversation with people from the Emirates and they said, look, energy is not a problem. Water is a problem for us. So, for example, for the Emirates that are importing most of the food, this is a perfect solution. Energy cost is low, uh, water cost is high. Uh, it's, a, it's a sweet point for, for solving that. Uh, Europe now with the energy cost going over the roof, probably not the best solution because it does have energy requirements. And the solar in, in Europe is not like the best uh, solution for alternative energy. I also think that if you're looking at uh, solar panels to operate something like that, it can help, but it will not be able to fully support uh, this kind of uh, an activity. So you will need to find other alternative for energy to operate farms like that. The ability to scale is relatively, you know, in leafy greens, they're already scaling. You can find yourself in big operations for leafy greens. I believe that with the solutions that are rising on other types of crops, this would be possible to scale. Okay. Uh, perhaps uh, some of the indoor farming might want to locate next to uh, server farms uh, where there's already a lot of electricity they going need, into them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> to take the heat away. You know, they need yeah. to evacuate a lot of heat out of those uh, areas. Yeah, yeah, for seriously, that, that could be interesting. Anyway, um, let's talk about demand for quality produce. What do you mean by that? And what are some of the solutions being brought to market? I think that uh, a lot of uh, uh, customers are looking to understand and have transparency of the supply chain, as well as, uh, I don't know if everyone understands, but about 30% of the crop does not even show up in the retailer. It just either you don't have enough people to pick it or you realize that the price you're going to get is too low because you didn't get the right size or the right timing for your fruit and about 30 percent is going to the base to the way so the way we see it we believe that the supply chain optimization supply chain security is definitely going to be uh, is already a big thing we invested in two companies in this field 
We invested in, in FruitSpec. Uh, FruitSpec is doing early stage uh, counting and size distribution. So the farmer has an actionable uh, decision making out of the data that is being collected. And by that, he will not have small fruit. He will have the right size fruit to be able to sell it. He will be able to manage uh, you know, the packing houses and the marketing people uh, can manage when to pick and where to pick because they have all the information. It's like going to the Amazon storage, okay? You, you need to send X amount of fruit to uh, Walmart at day X and they can say, okay, we have this fruit distribution, this, this size in this uh, orchard, go and pick there today. And that prevents a lot of waste of time, energy, and, and money in the supply chain. Uh, the second company we invested in is a SaaS company. They are doing, a, a, they're working with companies like uh, Starbucks and uh, Heineken. And they what they do is they manage all the farms that supply uh, materials to those companies and all, the, all the, the flow of the material throughout the supply chain. And by that, reducing significantly the losses and improving the yield of the farmers at the edge. So this is what we are looking at uh, when we talk about uh, supply chain optimization. What was the name of the uh, SaaS company? Agritask. Agritask, okay. Um, I, I guess there's probably some innovation in packaging of food too that helps preserve food longer. Um, yes. The, there are some uh, companies that are doing either through the packaging itself or through some kind of a technology that coats the fruit before packaging. And uh, so we have there are companies that are doing uh, sensing that have sensors that are giving you an information about, hey, there is a problem here, probably a rotten uh, uh, fruit. You might want to go and identify the box that has the problem and get it out before it spreads around. And there are a variety of uh, solutions that are being developed for post harvest. There is actually in Migal Institute up north a whole institute that is dealing with post harvest. And this is something that uh, really uh, gets a lot of attention today. Enlarging the the peak to eat length of time keeping the shelf life longer with the quality that you want so um you're talking about the SaaS company that helps optimize picking of fruit that may lead into the next topic robotics and automation so are there technologies that uh like robots that do the picking of fruit so there are companies that are doing picking of fruit. Uh, I think that are active uh, solutions in strawberries, for example. Uh, we went for a different approach. We said picking fruit usually results in very cost, uh, costly robots. And you see that uh, the robots for picking are relatively expensive. And we decided to go for additional, for alternative solutions. For example, Aruga, one of our portfolio company, started with a model of pollination. Bees are having a hard time with all the climate change to pollinate in the current uh, environment and th the temperatures. Like if there's a heat, a heat wave, the whole colony will probably collapse. They will not be able to survive 50 degrees in the greenhouse. So uh, they went into uh, greenhouses and they're doing uh, air puff pollination. And uh, when they're already there, they're collecting data. And because they already are moving in the greenhouse, they are they are adding models to replace heavy labor uh, activities like lowering, trestling, and so on. So if you have a robot that can work 24 hours a day, pollination happens on certain hours when the flowers are open, but on the rest of the time, the robot continue with other uh, activities in the greenhouse. So you're getting uh, kind of your your own worker in the in the greenhouse. So that's Aruga. And another thing regarding robotics and automations is precision irrigation. Because of the water um, sanctuary and the drought events, uh, we believe that precision irrigation is critical. Uh, we invested in Suplant. Suplant is doing full sensing of the plant. They have an arm that is doing uh, hardware with software 
and giving you a irrigation recommendation when should you open and when should you close your fossils. And they are also doing a SAS solution because they are collecting data for so many years. They already have a good algorithm to give you a good understanding of what needs to happen in your field. So this company is really growing fast. I think that the last drought event makes it very clear that if you don't manage your irrigation, your ability to optimize your crop growth is going to be difficult because, you know, people sometimes think, okay, I will over irrigate. So what? No, when you over irrigate, you actually hurt the roots of the plant and they're not capable of gaining more out of the over irrigation. So making it very precise saves you water and usually optimizes your, your, your yields. Yeah, so Israel has been a leader in precision uh, irrigation for for some years. Um, you know, so we understand that you're supposed to deliver the exact amount of water to the exact plant, the exact root. Um, is time an element of that too? Um, so, do they the software and so forth try to figure out the best time of day or the best time of the week to deliver that water? Is definitely well? yes. Yes, okay. they have uh, a lot of information around the weather. So all the algorithms are connected to weather forecast. And when they connect to weather forecasts, they are able to tell you, look, there is going to be a few days of severe heat. Start irrigating now so the plant is ready for this uh, heat wave. Don't wait for the heat wave to heat, the plant to start dropping. You know, the, when uh, the plant protection system is, it stops irrigating areas in the plant. They usually stop with the with the fruit and then with the flowers and and it really hurts your yields moving forward. So if you prepare right for a drought event, or if you know that there's gonna be uh, a lot of rain coming soon, you will not irrigate uh, significantly. You will wait for the, for the rain. You'll give something mild and let the rain do the rest. Okay, great. And the last topic, digital revolution. Uh, what do you mean by digital revolution in ag tech? So agri-tech is the last frontier for digitalization. A lot of farmers are using pencil and paper or using Excel if they're very advanced. And there's so much data flowing in. I think that the farmers today are so confused with the amount of data being dropped at them that they don't necessarily know how to draw decisions out of all the data that is being collected. So streamlining the data making sure that when it's collected, it's going to one system. Integrate, if they have a, an ERP system, linking into this ERP system and making it part of this dashboard. So you, you see that a lot of uh, uh, farmers are aging. You know, the average age of a farmer today is over 60. But with the digitalization, you see younger people going into this. Now it's becoming a high tech. You suddenly have a, a tractor that can move autonomically in your orchard. That's a blue white robotic solution. You, you have ability to monitor your beehives like Behero does. Uh, you're able to, you know, run a robot in your uh, orchard. Now, in these days, you, you can see that uh, uh, technology is going into agri-tech, but you have to streamline the data. You must make it accessible and helpful for the farmers. Otherwise, they're getting confused. And this is why, for example, both Suplant, FruitSpec, and AgriTask, they're integrating into the already existing systems of the farmer. They're not telling them, okay, you want to talk to our data? open another apps. No, they're integrating into what you already have and there are modules in this. So the digitalization is crucial for the ability of, uh, of farming to become more modern and more precise and generate more yields to feed the world. We're going to have significant uh, deficiencies in food supply coming soon. I don't know what the situation in Israel is, but in the United States, there's some tension between the farmers and the equipment providers like John Deere. Um, mm -hmm. So a big company like such as John Deere collects a lot of data. And I think they expect the farmers to license it back or to pay for that data. And the farmers say, well, that data is being collected when I do my work. You know, why do I have to pay for it again to, to use it? Um, so is that... A problem or any solutions to that tension? 
I think that is a problem. I believe that the data that is being collected by the farmer needs to stay with the farmer. Uh, all of our portfolio companies, we make sure that the data belongs to the customer. They can use it. They can work on it and give them uh, the results. And the agreement usually says that they will use the data to better the algorithm to serve the farmer at the end, but they will not use it and spread it to others. And they, the farmer that is the vehicle to collecting the data will not pay for the data that is being collected. It, it pays for the analytics on the data, okay? Things that the farmer themselves cannot do. So th that's kind of the approach that we believe is the right approach. And it generates a win-win between the farmer and uh, the companies. Okay, maybe the last question. Vertical farming, is that pretty much the same as indoor farming? Of course, it's vertical, but uh, or is it fundamentally different? So indoor is a general uh, statement of you're not growing it outside. So indoor can be a net house, indoor can be a, a plastic greenhouse, and it can be a vertical farming. I consider vertical farming as one section of indoor farming to the extreme that you control everything. That, of course, ups your yields and prevents you from being impacted by uh, severe drought events. Look at Europe. I know that Italy lost about 30% of their crop this year due to drought uh, event. Uh, with indoor farming, of course, you can do, you can't, you will, currently there are no plans to growing uh, apples and orchards indoors, but everything else pretty much can be grown indoors. So I think that... Uh, Vertical farming talks about growing in stores. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Um, this is a fascinating topic, an extremely important topic, especially now with all these concerns about food security because of drought, the Ukraine, supply chain issues, and even in the United States. Um, uh, so we could spend a lot of time talking about this. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. You were very generous to spend all this time and to introduce us to all these solutions that are coming out of Israel. That's why we call Israel the, the solution nation. So, um, Degani, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I always enjoy talking to people about this subject. Thank you.